powers come in many shapes. Balancing the forces of compression and tension depends on a good design. At 300 metres above street level, Sydney Tower is the tallest in the Southern Hemisphere. Pretty spectacular. Oh, it's a great view from up there. Sydney Tower, I've got no opinion. It's beautiful. Designing and constructing Sydney Tower took more than a decade. In this video, we'll find out how engineers overcame some of the design problems. And also look at the impact of the tower on the lives of Sydney people. A massive city building is an investment of millions of dollars with years of planning and testing before construction can begin. Even before the planning stage, architects begin the design sketches. Well, our clients, the AMP Society, indicated that they required a centre that would establish, without the shadow of doubt, the focal point of retail in Sydney. And the site in question was strategically located between the major apartment stores. The obvious uh, solution became very apparent to us at a very short span of time. I asked Don Crown, well, how, how do you envisage, what kind of a shape do you envisage? And um, at that stage, we, we didn't know what the basic components or structural materials or, or shape for that matter should be. And um, he sketched in a freehand, a, um, a shape which bears some relationship to uh, the shape of the tower uh, that you can see today. These freehand sketches can be the basis of the design idea, but they don't tell you whether the design is structurally sound. It's rather difficult to visualize it on, by drawings, by sketches on paper, but rather simple to do it by, in, in a model. So we just constructed a model comprising simple piece of water pipe. We put a bit of a blob on top and started playing with the strings uh, to simulate uh, the cables. Once the model is finalized, it needs to be tested for bending and twisting caused by wind and earthquake forces. Sydney Tower was designed to withstand extreme wind loads predicted to occur only once in a thousand years. Even on an otherwise ordinary day, winds 300 metres above street level exert tremendous force. Added to this, other city buildings funnel the wind gusts to high speed. You can imagine that if you stand on the ground, the wind velocity is quite different from the wind velocity at the top of the turret. And the profile of wind velocity and the gusting effect could in fact be reproduced in special tunnels which are called boundary layer wind tunnels. And the first of those was in fact built in Canada at the University of Western Ontario. These tests were carried out in the 1960s and it was several years before construction began. In the meantime, plans were drafted and engineers went through the long process 
of persuading officials that a tower like this could be built and made safe in the heart of the city. The tower supporting the turret is built from 46 steel barrels that are bolted on top of each other. The barrels must support the compressive forces in the structure. The turret was assembled on the roof of the centre point building for safety and ease of fabrication and then jacked up the centre column. The um, barrel unit is the, uh, the centre shaft of the tower which supports the, um, the weight of the turret at the top. It also supports the pre-stress in the cables. It contains the uh, three triangular double-decker lifts as well as two flights of fire stairs and all the services. The weight of the turret acting downwards must be supported by the centre shaft. An equal and opposite force is exerted at ground level which balances the structure. The forces which result squeeze the barrels of the shaft and are called compression forces. Steel cables help stabilise the turret. Like elastic, the cables tend to stretch these are called tensile forces. In order to withstand the immense tensile forces, the cables were made up of 235 single strands bound together. Each cable is 11 centimetres in diameter at centre point roof level. The um, cables under wind go into um tension on the windward side and ostensibly compression on the leeward side. We have uh, 56 cables and 28 going clockwise and 28 going anti-clockwise. The reason for the uh, double direction is to provide a torsional stiffness to the tower. The cables are arranged to cross. This is called a hyperboloid of revolution. It prevents the tower from twisting. Also, helping to stabilise the tower, a water tank on level 7 of the turret, weighing 180 tonnes. The water tank is suspended from cables. The mass inertia of the water tank resists and dampens movement of the tower. Shock absorbers are also used to absorb the energy of everyday wind forces. The engineering solution to these design problems has created a structure which is a landmark and unique and recognised worldwide. We had the heavy base, we had a slender column, we had a building on top, we had to tie it down, we had a problem of torsion, so we had to have two families of cables which intersected and it so happened that the two families of straight cables produce a, an envelope, a shape, which is known as hyperboloid of revolution. <laughs> so what you see there is a consequence, it's a result of pretty thorough engineering exercise. The design criteria are similar no matter what size the tower. We asked students at St Ives High School in Sydney to design and test their own model towers. Yeah, it's getting stronger. We've got to watch this twisting, haven't we? The forces that we're, we're trying to overcome here are tensile forces, you know, stretching, pulling apart, and compression, pushing together, and a combination of both, twists, both working together, which is bending. And we're resisting the bending forces by adding bracing. So, and that's the idea of the the bracing, which is creating triangles throughout your structure. On a construction site, engineers are always trying to reduce waste and keep costs down. These model towers were also designed to use resources efficiently while maintaining strength. But the critical factor can the towers support the design load? 
in this case, a bin filled with water. Most of the towers fail by bending, the, the members fail by bending or twisting. Um, some of them are, are not quite as stable as others. The sides fail by bending, didn't they? opening in 1981, Sydney Tower has remained a popular destination for school groups, tourists and locals. However, few visitors were aware that on the under turret, out of the reach of sunlight or rain, rust patches had formed leaving the steel surface unprotected. The column and the turret area of Sydney Tower is constructed of steel that's designed to rust to form a hard packed patina and then rust no more. This is an example of where we haven't had that hard packed patina occurring because we're not getting the cycles of rain and sunlight because this is in a rain shadow area. The steel was originally developed overseas and first used in 1935. It has the advantage of forming an impermeable coating, protecting the steel from further corrosion. Because of this low maintenance quality, it was chosen as an ideal construction material for Sydney Tower. When engineers noticed rusting on the under turret, they decided a platform was needed to allow regular maintenance. But first they had to overcome design problems. How would they make the platform light enough to be hauled above the city streets and bolted onto the centre column, and yet strong enough to carry maintenance crews? The solution? A platform made from light but durable aluminium alloy that could be made in sections and then hoisted into place. Following the structural engineer's design documents, draftsmen plotted the exact requirements using the latest technology. The original drawings, a, a drawing is on the plotter, supplied to the programmer, and he writes a program on the, the, the CAM system, computer data manufacturer. The instructions are sent from the computer to the machines which will cut and shape the components. In computer-aided manufacturing, people supervise the work, but many of the repetitive tasks can now be performed by machines. It's more efficient and there's less human error. Here, machines are automatically shaping the plates to be used in the platform. Once the sections are designed and made, they go to another factory for anodizing, a hard protective coating of aluminium oxide. Frames hold the panels in place while they're cleaned and then etched in a caustic bath. This eats into the surface of the aluminium and prepares it for anodizing. The anodizing bath is dilute sulfuric acid heated to around 25 degrees Celsius, which helps speed up the reaction. An electrical current is passed through the acid bath, causing a chemical reaction. Microscopic particles are attracted to the charged surface of the aluminium, forming a protective coating. A dye is added giving the finished product a distinctive colour, in this case bronze.
how to get the sections of the platform up the tower presented other problems. Large items were winched up the outside on guide wires. Workers carefully manoeuvred the materials up the wires. Each journey took around 20 minutes. A spreader beam helped separate the guide wires and stop them tangling. It was a dangerous and difficult operation. Any item falling up to 300 metres to the ground could cause a serious injury. Other smaller materials were carried up the lifts and onto the construction area through a porthole just half a metre wide. Riggers who are skilled in working at heights assembled the platform. For safety, riggers wore a harness and safety line. Building so high above the city is a very specialised job. So it's a long way down and they do get scared. I mean, anyone would, um, I mean, you've got the long way to fall and um, that's always in the back of their mind. Um, some people are okay, they just tend to let that go, but some don't, and um, most of it is fear of heights. That's the main aspect of it. Building the platform itself is only part of the maintenance program. To reach the affected areas further out, a working platform called a gantry was designed to hang from concentric monorails running above the platform. This gives access to the radial beams on the underside of the turret outside the cable net. Travelling on a monorail, a maintenance basket will also carry crews around the under turret. With the platform, this will allow the rusted areas to be sealed and treated with an anti-rust paint. Here, a wire walker basket and motor assembly is being tested. It will allow maintenance on the cables to centre point roof level. This is an important stage in finalising the design and making sure it runs smoothly. The platform was assembled in stages over more than six months. In line with safety regulations, work could only be carried out on days of low wind. There were also strict controls on the use of tools and materials. There's always a tag on our guy line on our, on our belts or um, wherever we needed to use that, that style of thing. The main, the main thing was, was bolts. I mean, there was 5,000 bolts in the whole job. I mean, that, that is a hell of a lot of bolts. If one fell, I mean, anything could happen. So we had to use baskets to um, put under every, every piece we put in or installed. Was, uh, was a basket put underneath so that anything fell, it was always falling into that canvas basket. It was a main issue of the whole job, was the safety because of the height that we were at, it was a safety issue. The final stage involved raising the gantry to the under turret. Hoisting the 800 kilo structure was a complex and difficult operation. Near the top, some guide cables were disconnected by hand, allowing the gantry to be lifted into its final horizontal position. With a few more adjustments, the gantry was manoeuvred into place.
secured to the monorails, the gantry and basket can be moved around the under turret area using a chain block. And with these devices, the maintenance platform was finally complete. As we've seen, maintaining a building like Sydney Tower requires special design solutions. Other city landmarks also need ongoing maintenance. Although it's expensive, they're important features of our built environment. In terms of marketing to the international tourist, I think they provide an easily recognised um, identification point for our city. Whenever they're looking through brochures or seeing a picture, they, a tourist will start to recognise and be reminded of Sydney as a destination. And that's a, a good thing for international tourism. Sydney Tower is among the world's tallest and offers 360 degree views of the city and surrounds. Like the Eiffel Tower, it was designed to be used as a tourist attraction. Tourism is an important aspect of our economy, bringing around $8 billion a year into New South Wales alone. And this helps create jobs for local people. Currently we're getting close to a million people a year to the observation level. Our forecasts for the next 10 years are looking at over 3 million people per annum. So that um, is significantly larger, so we do, as I said, spend a lot of time looking at how we're going to handle those people. More tourists create another problem where space is limited. The main tower shaft is only seven metres wide, so the lifts are triangular, fitting into half the shaft area. Three lifts can operate at once. To help reduce the waiting time, lifts are double-decker. These design features can carry up to 2,000 passengers an hour, each lift making the 300 metre journey in just 40 seconds. Providing facilities and services at this height is also difficult. Restaurant food is carried up in the lifts from early in the morning. There are three restaurants in Sydney Tower and other services must be provided. Toilets and restrooms, air conditioning, heating and lighting, waste disposal and communications. Good morning, Sydney Tower Restaurant. Fallian speaking. Um, Some companies the, uh, use the tower for mobile phone networks. Okay. In fact, communications is a very important aspect of the tower's role in the commercial life of the city. Antenna on the turret also provide radio and television links. The tower is built on a 12-storey complex of shops and offices. Centrepoint is linked to surrounding stores by a series of interconnecting aerial and underground walkways. Given all the facilities, how would you market the tower? An advertising agency in Sydney came up with this. I think we'll play a very significant role in the next decade leading up to and following the Olympics. We're a very natural symbol of the Olympic torch and I think in terms of the Olympic um, Games being held in Sydney, that identity can only be strengthened internationally. 
decades on, in a landscape dominated by office blocks, the tower is still an important feature of the Sydney skyline. What you see now, the structure, is not a result of some kind of a capricious design by an artist, but a, a proper engineering consequence responding to the particular requirements. <laughs>